Thank you to the team. That was really lovely, really wonderful. Good morning again, and for those maybe watching later on YouTube, uh, my name is Ryan, and excited to be sharing with you this morning the next part of our series. We're in the series together, the original new normal, we've called it, looking at different aspects and different uh, parts of our culture as Christians, our culture as Christians here at Chilton, Christianity, the kingdom, has a culture, and then we here at Chilton have a sort of version of that culture. We have our own sort of culture. We have our own imprint and our own identity as a church, as a local church, part of the global church in this world. And we've been looking at these different norms, the norms of our community, the, the, the values that we hold as believers. What are the patterns of our lives and how are they different to that in the world? And so we started off, if you remember, looking at for us, it's a value to know we are loved. We begin in the posture of knowing God's all-consuming love in our lives, not striving for it, not seeking to earn it, but knowing we are loved. And we work and serve and live from that position. And then Jason shared about what it means for us to be united to Jesus in union with God, in Him, spiritually connected and absorbed still maintaining our own identity, but our identity now found in Jesus. And last week, we looked so powerfully at what does it mean to live as Christians with faith and expectation that God can move at any moment. He can change our situation. He can change us. He can move. And so we live and pray and breathe with faith and expectation because our God is a powerful God. And we're only halfway we're only halfway through the series, really. We still have so many values to look at, so many norms to consider. What, what are our patterns for life? What is our original new normal here at Chilton Church as believers? And so today we're going to look at one of our next values, which is this, repentance. Repentance. You see, Martin Luther, who essentially began the Reformation when he nailed his 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral, well, the very, very first one of those theses read this, Our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, willed that the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. This is the very first of his 95 theses. The Christian life is a life of repentance. In fact, repentance is our door. It's our our gateway towards growing and maturing as believers. It's not only the entry that we repent and come to Jesus, it's actually how we continue to keep growing. It's how we continue to keep maturing. But for many of us, I think, when we think of this word repentance, there's a bit of a negative connotation to it. We, we tend to miss out on the blessing of it because it, it feels like something kind of sad and somber and, and it is weighty, but it kind of feels a bit heavy and it's, it gets a bad rap. But I think for us to truly grasp repentance will lead us into so much more fruitfulness and actually lead us into joy, lead us into a better experience of the life here on earth as believers, as people serving part of this community here at Chilton, a community that values repentance as a norm, as something we do all the time, regularly. That community thrives and grows but in order to grasp this blessing, in order to really understand, well, why is repentance actually such a blessing? Why is it such a, a good thing? It's actually really important then to understand, well, what do we repent of? What, what is sin? Another word that maybe gets a bad rap. Another word that, that isn't just really that popular, but often when we think about sin, we think about it as, well, breaking the rules. You know, there's a list of rules, there's a list of expectations, and if I break one of those, if I don't meet that expectation, that is sin. But actually, that's just the surface level of what sin is. See, sin is more than just breaking the rules. And when we understand how sin actually works, when we understand what it actually is, and appreciate then from that stance what repentance is, we start to see fruit and growth in our lives. And so I want to jump into Genesis chapter 3 and just look at the very, very first sin. Look at where we got it wrong. Look at the fall of humanity 
and learn what we can about how sin works. Because I think in this passage, we actually see a pattern for how sin tends to operate. And I'll, I'll throw in some other passages as well, just, just to sort of tease it out. But it's so important for us to look at this passage and see the pattern for sin and then go, okay, so how do we engage with that? How do we engage with that? And so we read together in Genesis chapter 3. Follow with me. Now the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, but about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said, you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. Just a little side by you. I thought this was just a little, little like sort of free add-on. It's so interesting to me that when you read her account of what God said and you compare it to what God actually said, you'll see that the first issue is an addition. God didn't say anything about touching the fruit. He said, if you eat it, you'll die. But, but we had, in this position, someone, and we, we may assume it was either Adam or Eve or somewhere, an addition had been placed on of don't even touch it. Because if you touch it, you'll die. But that's not what God said. And so the first lie, the first deception, the first error was an addition to God's word that placed an extra barrier looking to make things better, maybe trying to sort of stay away. But the problem was what happens then when she does touch it and doesn't die? Now she's gone, well, actually, I've touched it and I haven't died. Maybe there's no problem then if I eat it. Do you see how making an addition at the same level as God's word can sometimes lead us into real error and sin? I thought that was just an interesting thing to note. But we continue to read in verse 4. The serpent says to her, no, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. See, God created mankind to worship and enjoy him. To worship and enjoy him. God in his fullness creates humanity in his image with the task of reflecting his glory and beauty and wonder and love. In other words, to reflect him, to worship him, and to enjoy him as the most delightful human, delightful being in the universe. To govern the earth we were tasked with and to be fruitful. And he tells them, this is what is good. He defines what is good. He says, These, this year is good. Go do this. Be fruitful. Govern. Multiply. You have responsibility. You have purpose. You have tasks to do. Tons of trees to eat from. In fact, it's even mentioned that there's a tree of life, right? And God says nothing about that. It's right there next to the tree we're not supposed to eat from. Right there. It's right there and available. Life. And he says, just don't eat from this one tree. And then enters the serpent, who we understand to be Satan, the devil, our enemy, our spiritual enemy, a reality, who enters the picture and starts to tempt. And I want us to look at the three strategies that he uses that you will often find present in almost any temptation scenario. In almost any scenario where we are fighting against sin, these three strategies are being used against us. These are the three issues. He asks the first question, did God really say? It's an assault on God's truthfulness, on his word, on what he said. Is he trustworthy? Did he really say that? Is that really what he meant? Is this true? It's an attack on doubt. It's an attack on our doubt. He then goes on to say that God knows that if you have this, you would actually get these great things, right? Right? So he says, God knows that if you have this, you will get these amazing things. And he doesn't want you to have that. The implication is that God is bad. And he's trying to withhold something good from you. He's trying to withhold something that you need. He's trying to, he's trying to keep you away from enjoying the fullness of this, this blessing. And so it's essentially an attack on God's goodness. On God's motives and his intentions and his desires to bless us. And it appeals then to our want to our wants. The first one appeals to our doubts, to our, to our wonder, does, is God trustworthy? The second one appeals to our wants, is God good? 
And the third one is this, this appeal to, and you will be like God. You will be like God. It's an attack on who we really are and our position in creation. It's an attack on this idea that God is over us and we are accountable to someone other than ourselves and that God is a better God than we are. It's, it's an, a temptation that targets our pride. Doubt, want, and pride. The three strategies that the enemy uses when we're confronted with temptation. Did God really say that? And is he good? Is he saying that to keep us from something that we actually want and need? And thirdly, it might mean that we have to surrender our will because God is God. And we actually want to be our own God sometimes. These are the lies that in this moment are accepted. They believe that maybe God didn't really mean that. Or maybe that's not what he really said. Did he really say we die? Like, does he really mean death? Is he withholding something from us so that we could be like him? Do you see how these lies come into their ears? And they see then what God had prohibited and they begin to desire it. That's so important. They begin to want it. They see it as delightful and desirable. And so the action of eating follows a rejection of what God had said was good and true and an agreement with lies, an agreement with something that is false. You see, sin is the rejection of what God says is true and good and an agreement or acceptance with a lie to what is actually true and good. Do you see how it's not just breaking a rule on a list? That's when it becomes sort of just like this, this sort of mundane. It's like, okay, I've got these list of rules, and I've got to keep these rules, and if I break the rule, then I've sinned. It's like, no, sin's actually deeper than that. It's actually saying, I'm disagreeing with what God says is good. I'm disagreeing with God's truthfulness, and I'm choosing to live my own life, not surrendering to God, and I'm agreeing with the lies that these are better that this way is better, my way is better, God's not good, and what he says isn't true. I'm agreeing with these lies, and these lies find their origin in the enemy, in Satan. See, when we sin, we're believing a lie either about God, about ourselves, or about other people. Almost every sin you can find is rooted in a lie about God or ourself or others. And so disobedience is rooted in deception, being deceived by the great deceiver, the enemy. Now, it's important for us to acknowledge these spiritual realities, the reality of Satan in this passage and in, in the world, because we're not saying the devil made me do it. That's the furthest thing from the Christian worldview. There is no the devil made me do it. There's no sh you know, shelving blame and sort of saying, well, it wasn't really me. I just sort of got duped. No, no, no. We are responsible for our actions. But it's important to acknowledge his activity in the world, his activity in sin. And the Bible actually speaks about the devil with three sort of words that I think sort of capture this. It speaks about him as a deceiver, and you can read that if you want to take notes. I don't have these on, but it just speaks about him as a deceiver in Revelation 12, verse 9. Jesus himself called Satan the father of lies in John 8, verse 44. It speaks about him as the tempter in Matthew 4, verse 3, and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And then it speaks about him as the accuser again in Revelations 12. And it's amazing to me when I think about how sin tends to play out in life, that there's now clearly a deception that takes place. There's a lie that's sown into our mind and into our heart, and Satan's the deceiver. There's a temptation that's presented, something to be desired, and the one who's the, considered the tempter again is the enemy. And then isn't it funny how when we do mess up, when we do agree with those lies and then act on them, desire something and act in a sinful manner, how we feel so much shame. And we, and we sometimes then, even after having repented and come for forgiveness, we still feel shame. And it's because he's also called the accuser. He'll lead you into it and then kick you for doing it. And God does none of those things. He neither leads us into temptation, he neither leads us into sin, and he never kicks us when we're down. But the enemy, the father of lies, will deceive us, so lies, and if we choose in ourselves to agree with them, we tend to fall into temptation, and then once we're there, the one who's deceived us kicks us when we're down. It's, it's really, really challenging. It's why Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, he says, You were dead in your sins and your trespasses in which you previously walked 
according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and our thoughts. And we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. It's interesting to see the language that Paul uses to describe the activity of the enemy in the world. That we are the ones walking in this disobedience. We are the ones acting on our fleshly desires. And yet there is a world in which we're being tempted. And, and, and this is language, the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit working in the disobedience. This is language to explain the activity of the enemy. He goes around sowing seeds of deception and temptation to influence us. He's just, he's just using any sort of platform, any sort of object he can. He uses whatever he can to sow seeds of deception and influence. To get us to live in agreement with wrong ways of thinking. To accept patterns of thought. To accept broken ways of thinking about things, either about God or ourselves or one another. And then those patterns of thought lead us in to fleshly desires and sin. All of our broken desires are rooted in believing something wrong, are rooted in deception. Just, just think back to this Genesis passage. She has the evil desire, but what came before that? The deception, the agreement with the lie. And that led then to the wrong desire, and that led then to the action. I'd encourage you to read um, Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. He does such a good job of, of, in this novel, sort of unpacking different ways that the enemy can sometimes influence and, and, and sort of deceive us and, and sort, of, you know, sort of target us again. It's not always these big things. It's not, it's not about being some massive thing. It's sometimes so subtle. It's just these lies, these ways of thinking about things that we might sort of just knock off to cultural things or whatever it might be. But when we are not rooted in the truth of God, which can shape and mold our minds and our hearts, we can come into agreement with these lies and that leads us then to desire things that are not of God. This is how sin works. And it's not, it's not always as dramatic as it might sound. Some of you might think, wow, this is really dramatic. It's not. It's sometimes so subtle. But it's clearly more than just breaking a rule on a list. It's more than that. It's more than that. See, we can, we can attempt to deal with the actions Maybe we, bet, we go a bit deeper than that. We can tend to deal with the, with the desires that we have, that we know are not of God. But actually, we need to go even one deeper than that. What are the lies we're believing that lead us to desire the things that aren't of God and lead us to act in ways that don't honor God? And that leads us into real freedom, which is why then, our last passage for the today, Romans 12, which we've covered a few times already in this series, Paul then says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you, present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age. Which age? This world, the world that is being influenced by the enemy, the world where there is lies and deception all around us, trying to influence us to desire and to do things that do not honor God. Rather, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may discern what is good and pleasing and perfect will of God. See, if we, if we only think of sin in the one way, in the way of sort of a rule of, a rules that we need to break, you know, that, that, that's just sin, it's just breaking the rules, then we're only ever going to engage with it on the actions level. And so we try our best, we put little things in place, we try sort of constrain our actions, and maybe we're one of those people with a personality that has really good self-control, but even we know we're going to mess it up at some point. Right? And we just deal with it on an actions level, but we never actually change. And we're constantly fighting what we feel inside, and we're constantly like wrestling against this thing. And, and yes, it's meant to be a wrestle, but sometimes we just make it so hard, and it becomes burdensome and tiring. And we're only looking at changing our actions. We just won't get there. But if we want to experience this transformation, heart change, hearts being changed so that the way you felt once, don't, you don't feel that way anymore. The things you used to desire that you knew were sinful, you don't, no longer desire anymore. Or at least you're going better and better. You're going from glory to glory to glory. If we really want to see that, then we need to engage with the lies that are at the root of those desires. You see, trying to just deal with the actions is like trying to change an apple tree into a lemon tree just by picking the fruit. You just can't do it. 
You can't go to an apple tree, pick the fruit, and hope it becomes a lemon tree. It doesn't work that way. We need to deal with the roots. We need to go deeper than with that. Deeper than just actions. Real change, real transformation, and the best thing about it is real freedom. Like real release, real freedom. Walking in peace. You see, this all ties in with repentance because the word repent literally means change of mind. It means to change your mind. It, it's not a synonym for saying sorry. It's not a synonym for apologizing. And that's how we come to think of it. And that's where it loses its power. Because then what happens? We just keep saying sorry. We just keep saying sorry. We just keep saying sorry. And we feel guilty and shameful and we feel burdened. No, repentance is to say, I'm going to change, renew, replace the lies in my mind with truth of God and watch how that shapes my heart, shapes my mind to think differently and act differently. It's the core of what it means to repent, is to change our thinking. It's to make a U-turn in our beliefs inside. And it's what happens when we first come to Jesus. We know this. We come, we hear the message of the gospel, and we go, I've been living my own way. I've been living in rebellion to God, and now I receive that Jesus is my Savior, so now I'm going to turn away from that. I'm going to turn away from my own life of sin, and I'm going to pursue the cross. I'm going to pursue Jesus. I'm making a change, and I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to turn, and I'm going to face Jesus. That's repentance. That's coming to salvation. But then that happens every moment, every day as a Christian. That begins the pattern, the lifestyle of saying, in my mind every day, this isn't honoring God. What am I believing that's not true? Let me turn away from that and turn to that which is true, turn to that which is God. It's a continuing to turn from sin towards God, renewing our mind. It's coming into agreement with God's truth and rejecting the lies of the enemy. The inner change of direction from what is wrong to what is true, from lie to truth. It's helpful sometimes to provide examples. And, and in a way, I'm really, help, I'm really glad that these examples aren't like what we might consider <laughs> the big sins. Maybe some of you might think they are. Um, but, you know, it's because it's, it's about just daily engaging with repentance. It's about regularly doing this. It's about getting good at recognizing where our fruit isn't matching up to God and then going, I need to repent of this. And to repent of this, I need to recognize what maybe am I not believing that is right about God, myself, or others. <laughs> Okay, so for me, when I was a bit younger, I still, I mean, I'm not perfect, but really had issues with anger and frustration in particular areas, and some of you might relate to this, particular areas being traffic, <laughs> being in a car, and technology, but we'll focus particularly on the traffic one, and had some moments of outbursts that really were not godly, really not godly, really not great, driving, someone does something, I do something, I'm in a rush, I need to get something, I've left late and so I'm rushing, someone cuts me off and there's an outburst and it's not holy and it's not godly and it's not the fruit I want in my life and I'm really glad my pastor's not in the car and I'm really glad that no one's there to see me and it's wonderful and then, and then you sort of get, you go, oh, that was terrible and you sort of think, okay, well, I'll just do better, I'll maybe put on some Hillsong music in the car so that I sort of feel a bit more convicted about my actions, Okay. But at one point, I eventually got to this situation where I was thinking about it more like this. Not just changing my actions, but actually going, well, wait, why, why do I act like that? What, what am I believing that is making me respond that way? And how can I go through a process? It's not going to be a one-moment thing. I'm just going to change the life, flick the switch, and then I'm going to be a completely different person. No, it's going to be a process of making my heart, bringing my heart to God. But first, I need to identify what am I believing. And for me, and this might seem silly to other people, but for me, the lie that I believed was I was more important than the other people in the car. That, that, that the world somehow revolves around me and me getting to my place on time. And they were inconveniencing me. And so it was my selfishness and self-importance that led me to react because they're, they're insignificant. They're inferior to me because I need to get there and they're in my way. Okay? And I was going, wow, that seems a lot bigger than just maybe cussing in the car. That's actually a really big deal. I need to deal with that. Why am I believing that about? Why am I believing that my, my journey is more important than everyone else's? And I need to now pray into that. And you pray into that that changes your heart, not just your words and actions. Okay, hopefully you don't think too differently about me at the moment. <laughs> you know, another really simple one was just like something, something like sloth and laziness. You know, going in periods where you're sort of really unproductive. And again, asking the question, okay, well, I can try and sort of get a regime going, but what's the lie I'm believing that leads me into unproductivity? 
and laziness and sloth, which is a sin. It's believing that the process isn't as important as the result. It's, be it's believing that my time belongs to me, first and foremost, and not to either my school or whatever else, the, the responsibilities I have, or to God. Do you see how those lies influence thoughts, actions, intentions? See, in these examples, you, you see the process of dealing with the sin is recognizing it, wondering, okay, well, what's behind it? What's the lie? What's the deception? It doesn't always have to be this big thing. Sometimes it is. Sometimes there's moments where you have to get other people around you and go, okay, there's some big stuff here. What's at the root of it? Let's go deep. You know, and, and sometimes it's lies that have been sown from childhood that we believe about ourselves or about God or about the world, and we have to root those out. And roots that go deeper are harder to deal with. But it's just this process. It's understanding this, this method of approaching repentance and sin. See, in, in the Jesus Ministry course, the Jesus Ministry um, sort of group that we're part of as a church, they've developed a sort of approach to repentance, and they use the five R's, they call them, which sort of helps us to walk through this. And we've, we've touched on a lot of this already, but I thought it was just helpful to bring these to you as a way of approaching repentance and renewing your mind. And so the first one is, is really recognize. It's that. It's just seeing. It's, it's seeing, okay, there's fruit on this tree that's not right. There's, there's actions, there's words, there's thoughts, there's desires, there's not, and, and you sort of recognize. And sometimes the issue is we just haven't seen it yet. Sometimes we haven't had someone point it out to us yet. Sometimes we haven't had God point it out to us yet. But, but it's recognizing what's the action and starting that process of questioning, okay, now what's the lie I'm believing behind that? What have I believed about myself, about God, or about others that is leading me towards that action? Then we repent, saying, okay, now I'm turning away from that. I'm, I'm turning from those false beliefs. I'm rejecting that idea, I'm rejecting those beliefs, I'm rejecting those lies and the actions that come with them and I'm turning away from them, turning away. And then it's important as well to realign. It's not just, just about turning from something, but turning to something and saying, if those were the bad fruits, what are the good fruits? The love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. What is the good stuff that I wanna to turn toward, not just turn away from? Sometimes as Christians, we get so much about what we're not for and not about what we are for. It's good to talk about what we are for. We're for being loving and kind and patient and good. It's not just about the no's. It's about the yeses. What are we going after? What are we realigning to? See, I've got, a, I've got a, a verse that shows this realigning thing, but it also comes with a bit of a story. As a teenager who had come to faith, coming to faith, I think I was 14 at the time, I came to faith, and really, really engaged with the gospel, was really, really moved by the gospel, and had a lot of passion and zeal, and really excited to share with people about Jesus, but also really just passionate about the Bible, passionate about... about um, God's word and, 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 and had that sort of grinding in my bones when people weren't honoring God and, and walking in ways they weren't honoring God. I had people who would come to the youth ministry and they would say they were Christian and then live different lives. And I ended up developing this sort of what I'd call a Pharisee spirit, right? Where it's all about God's law and there's no grace. There's lots of zeal, but no love. Lots of loud, ungracious, unkind speaking, but not really reaching out to people with tenderness and with love. And I remember in one of these moments in my zeal, having an argument with one of my friends about an issue, a sin issue, and saying, oh, this is wrong. This is terrible. This is not how God wants us to be living. And, and you know, we sort of left on those terms. And I said, we, I need to show that I'm right. You know, I need to show them that they're wrong. I need to show them that I'm right. And so I went to pick up the Bible. Okay. And I was like, okay, I've got to find a slam dunk verse, right? To, to really show them that they're wrong. To now, let me just give you a clue. If you pick up the Bible with that reason in mind, you're using it wrong. You're just using it wrong. It's just not how it's meant to be used. We don't use the Bible to slam dunk our enemies or to slam dunk people who are in sin, who are meant to be our friends who need love and kindness. And so I do a little word search. And in my research, I come across this verse in 2 Timothy 220, sorry, the verse is wrong. There's 222 to 25. And it says this, flee from youthful passions 
and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Now, just to pause, this is where the realigning comes in. This is the, this is the part of the verse that really shows us what it means. It's not just about fleeing what's wrong. It's about pursuing what is good. Okay, and here I came to this verse, verse 22, and I thought, ah, I found my slam dunk. And I had, except I found it in a very different way. Because then I kept reading. And I came to verse 23. But reject foolish and ignorant disputes, because you know they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach, patient, instructing his opponents with gentleness. And in that moment, there was recognition. There was the spirit who God calls our comforter and counselor, and then Jesus tells us comes to convict us of sin. And in that moment, the comforter, counselor, through the word of God, brought conviction, recognition, and was like, this fruit's not what you think it is. This is not right. The way you're approaching people, the way you're speaking to your friend, the way you're engaging with them, they might be in sin, but that's not the point. You're now in sin. Because you're opposing them, not with gentleness, but with harshness, with ungraciousness, with no kindness. I recognized my sin, and I had to repent of my wrong and ask, well, what was the lie? And at this stage, I didn't even have these tools. I didn't know the five R's. I didn't think of repentance maybe in this way. But God in his graciousness led me to see it. There was self-righteousness there. There was superiority. There was judgmentalism. And I had to realign, realign, see myself as no better, as a simple servant coming with gentleness and graciousness and patience. That's the fruit of the servant of God. See, this was and is still very humbling for me. And I, I see occasionally, I've left a few of them up just as reminders on Facebook because unfortunately it wasn't just in person that I would be a bit of a a zealous idiot, but sometimes on social media, which, let me warn you, don't do that. And I would put some things, one, one thing I put up that was so harsh, my pastor called me and said, Ryan, you need to read Galatians with me because you clearly don't know what grace is. Really humbling. And I leave them up there so that I can remember it's not about being right. It's about reaching out in kindness and gentleness. But this is also an example, again, of what we're speaking about this morning, which is how do we deal with our sin when we do recognize it and then ask, what is the lie behind it? We reject that lie, we repent, we turn from it and realign to something better to say, what, what, is, it, what is it that we're gonna be instead? And just to quickly touch on the last two, because each of these R's could be a whole message on their own and we didn't wanna go through the whole thing, but just to wrap them up, the, the next step is to rebuke because if the enemy is the one who's doing the deceiving, we have actually been given authority to rebuke that. We don't just reject his lies, we reject him. The Bible says resist the enemy and he'll flee from you. So we rebuke him. We tell him we don't want any of his lies. We don't want any of his rubbish. We're coming to the truth of God. And then we replace it. See, if realigning is turning to what is good, replacing is then putting into our hearts that which helps us get there, the truths that go against those lies, that everyone is significant, everyone is needs to be loved and we fill our hearts with God's truth so that it roots in us this is repentance this is renewing our minds it's rejecting to what is false and holding on to what is good and so I want to ask us to respond together I want to ask us to respond together by praying and asking God to help us recognize what sin we need to deal with because I'm pretty certain I can confidently say that most of us are not perfect yet which means even if it's just the most subtle sin or a sin we've been wrestling for a while and, and still looking for more and more growth in, there's always something we can recognize, recognize what's behind it, recognize the lie, repent of that, realign to what God wants, replace with truth and rebuke the activity of the enemy. There's something we can be growing in. And when we think of it this way, it's not then this really negative, bad thing, oh, I've got to go and sort of repent. It's, this, it's a liberating thing. It's saying, what, what lies are shackling me today? What am I believing today that's leading me into things that are just not of God, that are not bringing me joy, that are not bringing me peace, that are not bringing me into greater intimacy with God? And how can I cast those off? How can I break free of that? Because God's promise is when we confess our sins, He cleanses us 
and redeems us and forgives us. And so let's make repentance something we rejoice in as we're freed from bondage and deception. Let's reclaim the blessing of repentance together. Let's walk into freedom as a community. Let's throw off shame and let's find healing together and wholeness and mercy and truth. This is how we're gonna grow. This is how we're gonna mature in the kingdom. And so what I wanna do is I'm gonna put up a psalm in a moment, which, which really is a prayer to, to God to help us recognize. It's a prayer for us to recognize. And I'm gonna put the psalm up. I'm gonna read it for us once. And then I'm going to ask you to just pray it in your hearts. Just 30 seconds, just in quiet. Just take that, the words in that psalm and just pray them in your heart and see if God wants to raise something. And you don't have to deal with it right this moment. Maybe you can. Maybe you want to fly through the R's right now and just repent and realign. and go. Maybe you need to write that down and go, you know what, I'm going to go and take some time at home and bring out my Bible. And, and in prayer, I'm going to work through this. What are the lies? And, and let's pray through that. But it's just good to sometimes take a moment and reflect and say, God, what is there? What's the next thing? What's the next step of glory I need to take? What's the next lie I need to dismantle so I can walk in greater freedom and truth? And then I'll, I'll pray over us and we can close with a song as the, as the team come up. Can, can I ask for that if, if we can stand together? If we can stand together now um, if you're able and if, you, if you're willing. And that's, I'm gonna read for us Psalm 139. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Let's just take a few moments just to pray that in our hearts and then I'll pray and invite the team up. So Father, we, we do pray as a community and as individuals that you would search us. Search our hearts and test us, God. Consider our thoughts, our concerns and, and see God bring to mind anything that is offensive to you that is in us and lead us, God, into the everlasting way, into greater freedom. I pray, God, for a softness within us that it, that is eager to come to you and say, what next, God? Which, which chain next? Which shackle next? You know, we, we want to run with freedom and we don't want to be held back. And sometimes we don't even see the shackles. Sometimes we know they're there, but we want to avoid them. But I pray, God, that the great comforter counselor, who is also the convictor, who with such perfect gentleness can point out the things we need to deal with, would come now and convict us, expose what we need to see, and give us the courage, God, to deal with it. Give us the courage, God, to pray through that, to recognize the lie of the enemy that's behind it, to repent and reject that lie, to realign to what is good, God, to realign to what you want for us. We pray, God, help us to do that daily. May we really be those who live lives of repentance. May it be something we recognize as a blessing, coming to you to find forgiveness and more than that, freedom, that we might run unhindered and serve you unhindered, God. We pray for renewed minds. We pray, God, that we would know your truth and walk in it. The Spirit is also the Spirit of truth, and your word says he leads us into truth. And so may we respond to him as he leads us in conviction, and may we respond to him as he leads us out of sin and into truth. I pray, God, for all of us who, who are responding. And if, the, if there are things in our hearts that we've now recognized that maybe just need a bit more work, need a bit more help, God, may we just reach out to those around us and have people come and pray through these things with us. Pray together. May we do battle together because repentance is no longer a thing to be ashamed of, but a thing to be rejoicing in and a pattern that we live out here at Chilton.
a pattern that we live out of rejecting the lies of the enemy and rejoicing in the truth of God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.